From the very beginning of this series, we've talked not only about economic concepts like price signals and spontaneous order, but also about the underlying nature of political power and the way that incentives affect all people's behavior. To some extent, this may seem like a broad focus, but these themes are entirely related. Most people don't even notice the way their behavior is shaped by the rules and institutions of their society or how powerful those forces can be. But in the somewhat ironic words of John Maynard Keynes, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. Keynes was wrong about a lot of things, but he was right about that. In fact, I think that right now, we're all living through a moment in time when those words have never been more true. And yet, one thing I have perhaps devoted an insignificant amount of time to on this show is the nature of the economy itself. So today, as we stare down the metaphorical barrel of an economic catastrophe, I want to take a deeper look at the structure of the film and entertainment industry, what the big short got right and wrong about the 2008 recession, and the ripple effect that our current crisis is going to have for people around the world. And hopefully, in the process, you'll see that the economy is not some machine with levers to pull and buttons to push, but rather an incomprehensibly complex network of human relationships and productive activity. This may be our most challenging episode yet, but I promise you, it'll all come together. I hope you'll stick around, and by the end, give this video a like, hit that bell icon, and share it with all your friends. Welcome to Out of Frame. Like a lot of other non-essential businesses shut down across the United States, the entertainment industry is in free fall. Actors, musicians, set designers, costumers, electricians, grips, camera operators, craft service people, thousands of freelancers and gig workers are out of work with no clear sign of when they might return. Major projects have been put on hold. Blockbuster releases have been rescheduled. Even huge companies like Disney have taken a massive hit. With their theme park shut down by law all over the world, they've been forced to enter into a $5 billion credit agreement just to survive. AT&T, which owns Warner Media and DirecTV, and which had already laid off hundreds of people, is still looking at ways to cut tens of billions of dollars in expenses. They just took on $5.5 billion in new loans. AMC has closed over a thousand movie theaters worldwide and furloughed their entire corporate staff, along with 26,000 theater employees. And even if their theaters are allowed to reopen soon, with so much fear of the coronavirus permeating our culture, who knows how many will actually be able to come back. The same story is playing out everywhere, and we're barely scratching the surface. What's happening right now is going to ripple through supporting industries and the freelance community in a way that literally no one can fully understand, and few people are even a little bit prepared for. But we'll come back to that in a moment. First, we need to fix a common misconception. I've talked to hundreds, maybe even thousands of people about these ideas over a lot of years, and I've come to a realization. When most people think about the economy, they think about big abstract concepts like gross domestic product, bank account balances, and obscure stock symbols on the TV. Politicians talk about economies like their cars that can be started, stopped, accelerated, and steered wherever they want to go. Even the academic terminology is dense. Autarky and aggregate demand, diminishing marginal utility and equilibrium, Pareto efficiencies and price indexes. For most people, it's all super confusing and leads them to believe that they need to be a wizard at finance and advanced mathematics to get it. But in reality, the economy is just people. I know that sounds like an oversimplification. It really isn't. Economies are natural extensions of human behavior, like language or culture, that emerge spontaneously as individual people interact with each other, exchanging the goods they make for stuff other people have that they want more. The first caveman to offer a fish he caught for a stone tool someone else made was creating an economy. Over centuries, people have formed bigger, more complex societies, in large part as a result of bigger, more complex trading networks. And now, the economy is global. It's a mesh of human interconnection and 
our lives are immensely better for it. Fortunately, understanding all of this does not take a PhD or a background in calculus. We can see economies in operation every day as long as we know what to look for. From small-scale interactions like two kids swapping sandwiches at lunch, to global mass production that relies on millions of people cooperating through complex corporate partnerships, it's actually easy to pierce the abstract veil of economic jargon and find the humanity beneath. All it takes is curiosity, logic, and a little bit of empathy. So with that in mind, let's go back to the film industry. It would be too complicated, impossible even, to know, let alone show, all of the individual human beings, skills, and jobs that actually have to come together just to make a movie. But by working our way backward through a few pieces of the overall network, I think you'll start to see what I mean. All around the world, politicians have instituted policies that prevent larger gatherings and shut down companies that they've called non-essential businesses. Nothing could be more obviously included in both categories than movie theaters. Not only are they inherently bringing together hundreds of people into one tightly packed area, they're also the epitome of frivolous in the eyes of the government. But what does it really mean to shut the entire industry down? On the surface, it means that people can't go see movies in theaters. But since almost half of all people in the US only go once a year or less as it is, and just 14% go more than once a month, nobody thinks that's a very big deal. In the middle of a pandemic, surely it's no harm for people to just stay home and watch Netflix instead, right? But of course, the shutdown also means that everybody who's employed in the movie theater business is currently out of work. The top five theater chains in the US, AMC, Regal, Cinemark, Marcus, and Harkins, employ over 100,000 people, virtually all of whom are now laid off or furloughed. I'm sure they think this is a pretty big deal. But let's dig deeper. With no screenings, that also means no movie theater concessions. It turns out that Americans consume 15 billion quarts of popcorn every year, with 30% of that happening at the movies. In 2018, the popcorn industry did over $1.1 billion in sales. But now, with no orders coming from theaters for several months, those sales are gonna tank. That means more people could lose their jobs. It also means that a lot of surplus popcorn will need to be sold before companies like Act Two and Orville Redenbacher place new orders with the farmers who grow the corn. But farmers plan their crops a year or more in advance. In Nebraska, where I grew up, Corn gets planted in May or June, but fields are being prepared right now, and the things you need to do to plant one crop on one timeline can't just be switched over to some other crop that grows in different weather and soil conditions on a different schedule. So corn farmers across the United States and everywhere else in the world are going to take a loss as well. But we're not done. The reduction in orders rippling across the network means less revenue to farm co-ops and processing facilities, less revenue to companies that dehydrate the corn. It means that trucking and rail companies that transport the corn to processing plants have fewer customers. And that means that all of those businesses may also have to lay off employees and reduce expenses, which inevitably means more ripple effects throughout more areas of the economy. Business owners' plans for expansion will be canceled. New factories won't be built, better machinery won't be purchased, improvements to worker safety and comfort won't materialize, pay and benefits will be cut. People just now graduating college will find a job market with a fraction of the opportunities that were available when they started. As someone who finished grad school in May of 2007, I know what that's like. In the end, it will be millions of people affected by shutting down just this one part of one industry. There are thousands of parts of hundreds of industries that are not allowed to do their work right now. Every one of them will be affected. As I said, the economy is a mesh, a web, a network of interconnected people. The effects don't just flow in one direction. Tons of my entertainment business friends are struggling right now, but I'm actually one of the lucky ones. While I've done a lot of jobs that would not have survived this, like the year I spent working as a music manager on cruise ships, most of my career has been spent at a computer. From when I started out as a music supervisor to my time as a music editor for a software company, and then all the years I've produced and edited video content, created motion graphics, and recorded voiceovers like this one, 
I might as well have been in training for extended quarantine. But even still, to do my job, I need content. Most of that content has to be created in the real world, and it often requires hundreds of people coming together. All those people I mentioned at the beginning, actors and costume designers, set decorators, gaffers, camera operators, if their productions are shut down, editors have nothing to edit. Composers have nothing to score. That creates ripple effects too. If people like me have fewer clients and less work, we also have to make tough choices about how we deal with that. We might put off upgrading our computer hardware and software, or maybe we'll forego hiring anyone to help organize footage. And if we have no work at all, well, like anyone else, we're in real trouble. In the words of one of my favorite living economists, Donald Boudreau, most of what constitutes our prosperity is a flow of finely coordinated activities, each performed by highly specialized workers. In normal times, this flow of activities is largely out of sight. My point in all of this is to encourage you to look around your world and try to think about what you're not seeing. Look for what's out of sight. As you do that, consider what it really means to shut down the economy. What's happening right now is catastrophic. In March, we saw the largest stock market crash since 2008. The spike in unemployment is literally off the charts and worse than we've ever seen. More importantly, with so many people out of work, a ton of goods and services are simply not being created. It's bad. And while I know a lot of people will blame our current situation on the pandemic itself, the truth is that there were a lot of other policy options that weren't discussed or even considered. Viruses have been a part of the human experience since the beginning of time, but what we've done in response to this one is completely unprecedented. I think that like most recessions and depressions throughout history, what's happening today is overwhelmingly man-made. Adam McKay's 2015 film, The Big Short, is a flashy, smart, and even mostly accurate portrayal of the financial industry in the two years leading up to the housing crisis of 2007. It follows the actions of a few central characters. Scion Capital hedge fund manager, Michael Burry, Mark Baum, manager of Front Point Partners, working with Jared Vennett, and a pair of young guys just starting their own firm, Charlie Geller and Jamie Shipley, with the help of the reclusive former investment banker, Ben Rickard. They're all based on real people who were among the first on Wall Street to figure out that the mortgage industry was on the verge of total collapse. The movie does a pretty good job of trying to make complex concepts like mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, and credit default swaps easier to understand. But by painting the causes as purely issues of corporate malfeasance and ignorance at every level, the film misses a massive opportunity to talk about the role the government itself played in creating the housing crisis, starting with the inflation of the very bubble that caused it. Jared Vennett, played by a very smooth Ryan Gosling, explains the mortgage-backed securities market using a game of Jenga. He shows how the bonds themselves were built on large groups of individual mortgages with varying degrees of risk, called tranches. Traditionally, mortgages and mortgage-backed securities had always been a boring, safe investment because the mortgages themselves were very safe. Home buyers were well vetted, put up significant down payments, and the homes themselves served as collateral for the banks. But when Michael Burry started digging into the details, he realized that that wasn't true anymore. In the early 2000s, banks started making huge loans to low-income, high-risk individuals with no money down and variable interest rates that would go up over time. These new mortgages and the investment products built around them were no longer safe. When they failed, everything failed. But what the movie doesn't really get into is how this happened in the first place. Why did banks just start making incredibly high-risk loans to people who are unlikely to be able to pay them back? Well, because the government created the incentives and gave them the money to do so. In the 1990s, Congress decided that home ownership was critical to reducing poverty and modified a number of laws, such as the Community Reinvestment Act, to explicitly encourage banks to make more housing loans to low-income people. At the same time, the government mandated that over 50% of the loans made by government-sponsored enterprises like the Federal National Mortgage Association and the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation had to go to low-income buyers. 
But since these kinds of loans are very risky, banks wanted guarantees from the government that any loans that didn't get paid back would be insured by taxpayers. This created what economists call a moral hazard. Of course, that's not all. Around the same time, in response to the bursting of the dot-com bubble and again after 9-11, the federal government employed some of John Maynard Keynes' ideas, told you it was ironic, and pushed through huge stimulus packages. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve reduced interest rates in order to increase the money supply. So not only were banks required and given strong incentives to make risky loans, with so much new money flooding the system, they also had the means to set up a house of cards built on wildly over-leveraged investment schemes. Most dangerously of all, they knew that if things didn't work out, they wouldn't be the ones on the hook. There's going to be a bailout. Well, they had to, right? I mean, paper markets would have collapsed. They knew. Cash would have stopped coming out of ATM. They had to backstop this. They knew the taxpayers would bail them out. They weren't being stupid. They just didn't care. There's more to the story, of course, but some economists were already warning of a housing bubble even before Michael Burry caught on. In 2004, Auburn University economist Mark Thornton wrote, given the government's encouragement of lax lending practices, home prices could crash, bankruptcies would increase, and financial companies, including the government-sponsored mortgage companies, might require another taxpayer bailout. It's a shame that the big short leaves all this out, especially because understanding this stuff could have helped us prevent it from happening again. Instead, in response to the housing collapse, the federal government under George W. Bush and Barack Obama pushed even bigger stimulus packages and used the Fed to flood the market with even more money. In a 2016 interview with New York Magazine, the real-life Michael Burry criticized these policies, saying, we are right back at it, trying to stimulate growth through easy money. It hasn't worked, but it's the only tool the Fed's got. Meanwhile, the Fed's policies widen the wealth gap, which feeds political extremism, forcing gridlock in Washington. This is toxic. As Burry went on to explain, interest rates are used to price risk. And so, in the current environment, the risk pricing mechanism is broken. That is not healthy for an economy. No. No, it's not. And yet, that's what we were already stuck with before fear of COVID-19 led governments around the world to forcibly stop hundreds of millions of people from operating their businesses and earning a living. This is why it's so important to see the economy as human beings instead of statistics. If we're right, people lose homes, people lose jobs, people lose retirement savings, people lose pensions. You know what I hate about in banking, it reduces people to numbers. Here's a number, every 1% unemployment goes up, 40,000 people die, did you know that? While a specific number like 40,000 is extremely hard to assess and may or may not be true, increases in unemployment are correlated to a number of major social problems. Depression and drug use goes up. Domestic violence goes up. Suicides go up. People lose years of their life to stress and delayed medical treatments. Children die. I thought we were better than this. I really did. And the fact that we're not doesn't make me feel all right and superior. It makes me feel sad. I just know that at the end of the day, average people are going to be the ones that are going to have to pay for all of this. Regardless of the risks of coronavirus or how effective lockdowns have been at saving lives, the cost of these policies are both very real and far greater than most people have even begun to consider. The trade-off is not human lives versus the economy. It's all human lives. A few weeks ago, Michael Burry resurfaced to criticize the lockdowns, calling them criminally unjust, and told Bloomberg News that universal stay at home is the most devastating economic force in modern history. I agree. We need to think about the economy less like a car that can be driven or controlled by a politician or a group of technocrats, and more like an organic, living brain. If you start removing synapses, eliminating nodes and connections, the brain starts to become unstable. And the more that get removed, the more likely the brain is to die. Economies work the same way, for a lot of the same reasons. The more companies you shut down and the more economic connections and relationships you eliminate, 
the harder it is for all businesses to function. Even some of the ones that haven't been told to close their doors won't survive because they rely on all the ones politicians decided weren't essential. And with all of those productive, creative people sitting idly at home, waiting to be allowed to go back outside, a lot of the stuff that actually improves our standards of living will become scarce and cease to exist. To quote Don Boudreaux one more time, Ultimately, our wealth consists chiefly in the ongoing willingness and ability of millions of strangers to work for us daily. Any obstacle to large numbers of people performing their daily jobs means hardship for us all. Trillions of dollars in stimulus bills and enhanced unemployment payments cannot make up for the loss in real human productivity. Instead, that's a one-time band-aid that will have to be repaid in the form of future taxes and inflation. We are all interconnected and essential. And when we allow governments, no matter how well intended, to decide which businesses can operate and which can't, we are allowing them the power to create compounding problems that have earth-shattering consequences for billions of people. We'll get through this, and we'll do it together. Connections will reform, new businesses will emerge. But I hope that once this is all over, people finally learn how important free economies are and that we never do this again. Hey everybody, thanks for watching this episode of Out of Frame. I'm sure there will be a lot to talk about in the comments, but mostly I just want to know how everybody's holding up. Let me know how you're being affected by all this. I also have an announcement. We finally set up a Patreon account for the show. So if you're a fan and want to help us make more content, please check out the link in the description and consider donating a few dollars each month. And don't forget to like and subscribe to all our social channels on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time.